Uh, Dr. John D. Roth is uh, here. He's a professor of history at Goshen College. He's also the uh, director of the Mennonite, uh, the Mennonite uh, Historical Library and editor of the Mennonite Quarter Quarterly Review. Uh, John writes extensively on Mennonite uh, affairs, and uh, I suspect many of you uh, read his column in the uh, in the Mennonite that uh, is there on a regular basis. Um, John's most recent efforts, uh, or, or more recently, has much in, been much involved in establishing the found the um, Institute uh, of Global uh, Anabaptist Fellowship, and is actually doing some research projects uh, in that uh, area. Um, John is going to be speaking to us today on the uh, how Mennonites and Catholics got connected in the 16th century and thereabouts. So, uh, John, thank you. Okay, let's see, does that, uh, yeah, I think that sound system is working just fine. Well, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, we tell our students that one reason for a liberal arts education is that you leave here to be lifelong learners, and so it's great to see that uh, that admonition to 18 and 22 year olds carries forward to people uh, at your stage of life. Uh, I think it's, it's a great program, and I'm glad to be part of it. I'm also glad to be part of it in an ecumenical uh, context, because um, I've been teaching Anabaptist history, church history of various sorts for a long time, and I often hear myself saying things and wondering how that would sound to somebody who actually grows up in that, is, is part of that tradition. And so it's great to see um, Judith here. I saw Margie File walk in. People who not only are scholars of Catholic history and doctrine, but also have lived it and in, in know this tradition in their bones in maybe the same way that I feel like I kind of know the Anabaptist tradition, not just in an intellectual way, but having, having lived it. Um, at the same time, I recognize that it puts a kind of um, a, a happy burden uh, on a presenter because I'm going to be speaking about really broad themes in a very short period of time, and you necessarily will hear yourself saying things that are far more simple than the reality uh, actually was. And so I just trust that there will be some conversation afterwards that those of you who are listening with a critical ear can supplement uh, uh, if, if I say something that doesn't quite capture uh, the full nuance. Uh, I'd like to offer one perspective on the uh, Anabaptist origins. The Mennonites, along with the Hutterites and the Amish, are part of groups that come out of the radical wing of the Reformation, and we trace our shared beginnings to a group called the Anabaptists. So when I use the term Anabaptists here, I'm referring to the 16th century beginnings. And I'd like to say a few words about the beginnings of the Anabaptist movement, but right from the start, I want to put it in uh, the context of our, um, let's see, of our conversation, because the Anabaptist movement was born in a cauldron of conflict. There's just no getting around it. The Reformation, we celebrate it as the, from a Protestant perspective, as the unleashing of the word, as the recovery of apostolic faith. But in truth, it was a family quarrel that led to a really um, uh, sometimes vicious, uh, not just divorce, but in some ways the fragmentation of the church. Uh, and, and it's an ongoing question for Protestants, to what degree is that to be celebrated? There are something like 45,000 different Christian denominations in the world today. In the United States alone, I think 38,000 registered with the IRS, each of them claiming to be the true church of Jesus, each of them going back to the book of Acts and saying, yes, that's, you know, that's, that's who we are. Uh, and you look on that and you say, yes, but how can that be? Where is the true church? And the Catholic, the universal church, has a, a deep in its understanding a view that the body of Christ cannot be divided. 
And so when there emerged in the 16th century voices that went clearly counter to the Catholic Church, the question is, what, who are these people? And these people are outside the faith, which makes them heretics and a threat to not just religious order, but a threat to political order, political well-being, the good the, the, of orderly civil society. So if you have people preaching contradictory things about the church or about doctrine, each claiming for themselves the authority to make their own uh, understanding of the faith, you are headed towards anarchy. And so the Anabaptist movement emerged uh, in, a, in a context of conflict, and the Im initial reaction or the initial response, and it's deeply embedded in the Mennonite psyche, is that when we think about Catholics in the 16th century, we think about persecution. Um, I was going to bring, uh, Judith thought this was a martyr's mirror, it actually uh, uh, is a Bible, but if I had brought the martyr's mirror, you would have seen a thick book that has taken on a kind, it's become a, we don't really have uh, icons in the Mennonite tradition, but the martyr's mirror comes close because it is a symbol, it stands for collective memory, and it's a way of thinking about our faith through stories, and the stories that are preserved in the martyr's mirror, at least a significant portion of them, come from the 16th century, and they are stories of our forebears, mothers and fathers, being persecuted and killed on account of their faith, and the preponderance of the people who were doing the killing, as it's told in the Martyr's Mirror, were Catholics. And this, the book, if you, read, if you read through that book, most people don't read it, uh, it's a symbol, but if you would read it, you would find some very nasty things in that book about the Catholic Church. I just pulled one quote, um, but it's one almost at random. So the author of this was a Dutch pastor in the 17th century. Besides these most ungodly things, the popes were drunk with the blood of the saints. Yea, they did not only pour out as water the blood of the beloved friends and children of God, those innocent Anabaptists, but besides inconceivable cruelties, they heaped also the greatest ignominy upon their bodies, throwing them like mire on the earth or giving them to beasts for food or on stakes and wheels to the birds to devour. And the Martyr's Mirror, this actually comes from a, a, not, not, a, not the Martyr's Mirror, but if you know the Martyr's Mirror, you know that it's accompanied by illustrations that bring the story home in a very vivid way of the suffering of, uh, of, of Anabaptists. And yet, in the next breath, I have to say that we are living in a profound uh, different context. So 500 years later, as we prepare to celebrate the beginnings uh, of the Reformation movement, we recognize that the world in which we live today is really quite different from the memory that we preserve in the martyr's mirror. This is a cover story from the March 3, 2014 the Mennonite um, uh, periodical or denominational periodical shortly after the uh, election of Pope Francis in which um, uh, uh, a Mennonite sociologist who got his PhD from Notre Dame uh, continues to be a, uh, and teaches now at a, at a small Catholic university but continues to identify as a Mennonite writes a very interesting article Habemos Papo Mennonitum uh, we have a Mennonite Pope um, and we also know that in the last 50 years, we have been privileged in our, I would say this, now maybe you'd look at it differently, but we've been privileged in our lifetime to live in a, a, a really a sea change of attitude and perspectives, at least on the Mennonite side towards Catholics. Now that's a generalization. Not all Mennonites are equally enthused about the work of bridge folk or, all of, or of other ecumenical initiatives. But the days in which Mennonites that Glenn described, Mennonites would talk about Catholics with hushed voices or would never contemplate the possibility of their child marrying a Catholic or, as is the case in some Latin American countries still today, would distinguish between Cristianos y Catolicos between Catholics and Christians, 
those days are really, I think, uh, over among Mennonites. And uh, I want to hold that before us, before I go back to the 16th century, to say that the things that seem self-evident, even for long periods of time, and we were talking four and a half centuries, uh, actually can change and are changing. And this gathering is one visible symbol of a new interest, a new curiosity, a new hunger to learn more uh, about, uh, about each other. And I'm really glad to be part of that. Just uh, very quickly, um, of course, you see here uh, Pope Francis. Um, Bridge Folk is a lay-initiated movement uh, connected uh, especially between um, Mennonites who, many of them were in interreligious marriages, who were hungry for more conversation partners, and created sort of on their own, without waiting for the official structures to bless it, created a context for conversation. And it was aided in a very significant way by St. John's um, Monastery, Abbey, in Collegeville, Minnesota, in which the bishop, or the abbot, uh, a man named, with the last name of Clausen, um, though no direct Mennonite background, uh, and, and, his, um, and his group took this on with a kind of um, a, a deep passion that this is an important conversation to move forward. And so the Bridge Folk conversations have been happening annually uh, ever since. I want to go back to the 16th century and in very broad strokes um, describe the emergence of the Anabaptists and save most of my time for um, offering a few thoughts on how the Anabaptist movement is deeply indebted to the Catholic tradition. Again, in broad strokes, if you're looking at Catholicism from the perspective of the Reformation in the early 16th century, popular Catholicism, that is, the, the faith as it was practiced in the villages and hamlets in the, among ordinary people, popular Catholicism seemed to be a faith that was anchored in the visible world. Now, there's a long tradition of theologians, there's a long intellectual and theological tradition in the Catholic Church that was carried forward in the universities, uh, and there's a lively spirituality that I'll also come back to talk about. But in at least the, 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 the perception of many people who were engaged in the Reformation movement, popular Catholicism was closely linked to visible, tangible, the material world in things like uh, pilgrimages. So that if you're a good Catholic, you went on a pilgrimage. And things like a veneration of saints, so saints' days that would be uh, recognized. Uh, uh, at harvest time, the village priest might accompany the parishioners around the fields with incense in a very visible way, blessing the planting of the field. Uh, if you um, uh, maybe were particularly interested in piety, you might make a pilgrimage to a cathedral where the relics of certain saints could be found. And so you would um, show your devotion to God by um, being in the presence of these visible material evidence of the biblical story, of the Christian church. Now, again, that's an oversimplification, but part of the uh, impulse of the Reformation was a quite conscious rejection of these, this emphasis or, uh, on the visible, which Martin Luther, in really sweeping language and vitriolic language, the language that only can be generated by somebody who is deeply part of a family tradition that he now is trying to leave, and he's going to you know, leave it far behind, Luther was ready to describe virtually all of, of Catholic uh, of, of the, 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 the visible part of, Catholic, of, of Catholicism as nothing more than exterior um, um, clutter that got in the way. So it's the institutions 
uh, the dead weight of institutions, the dead weight of a tradition, and these um, uh, uh, energetic efforts by poor people to live out their faith by embracing what he saw as superstition, as a kind of idolatry of this visible part of the material of, 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 of faith. And in its place, with a vengeance, Luther says no true faith has to be understood as uh, invisible. True faith has nothing to do with the external deeds, the outward signs of piety, which he dismissed as merely good works, you know, works righteousness. The thought that going on a pilgrimage or saying Hail hey, Marys or doing penance or giving alms to the poor would somehow make justified in the sight of God for him was uh, absurd. God, the holiness of God could never be matched by human efforts to come before God as if we had somehow earned God's favor. He lived under the burden of a kind of exteriorized faith. And for him, the great liberating insight was, well, we are saved by grace alone, by God's initiative. And nothing you do, nothing you do has any bearing whatsoever on the gratuitous, the unmerited initiative of God's grace. And that happens as a mystery. No external sign is evidence that you are saved, that you've been a recipient of this grace. Um, and it took some other, this sort of emphasis on the invisible, took some other forms too. Luther had, was challenging the authority of this church and this tradition. And one foothold that he has to push back on tradition and the sacerdotum, the institutional authority of the church, is the Bible. And he says it's not this the text, it's not the literal word, it is the active inner word, the invisible word. It's the spirit that transforms as one reads the text that you are transformed by this. And the human response, Luther says, the human response of faith is really nothing more than just thank you. It's simply an acknowledgement that, what, that God has done everything. But at its core, all of this is happening on the inside. You, you, you know, and it's carried over in Protestant language. You know, you accept, I accept Jesus Christ into my heart as my Lord and personal Savior. We've heard that over and over again, right? We, we, what does that actually mean? To accept Jesus Christ into my heart as my Lord and personal Savior. It's some, it's a transaction, I guess, between God. It's like an on-off switch that, but Luther is adamant that it has nothing to do with the exterior. Um, and uh, the Anabaptists emerge in this deeply indebted to Luther. They are, most of the early Anabaptists begin their careers as Lutherans, Lutheran pastors. But they see, they're frustrated with what they see as some limitations or in, the incompleteness of Luther's understanding. Uh, and they push they push forward in some very distinctive directions. Um, I see that the, our screen is not quite lined up, but that's all right. I just want to identify four ways in which the Anabaptists don't quite fit either with the Catholic tradition to whom they're deeply indebted or the Reformation tradition to whom they also are deeply indebted. Both the uh, Catholic and, let's say, the Lutheran tradition kept sacraments, kept the idea of sacraments, that there is a mystery involved in the ritual act so that when a, a priest baptizes a baby, something, God is present in a, in a transformative way that is real. Anabaptists rejected that, at least to a certain extent, and they said, no, the sacraments are signs. They point towards something but they don't actually affect the actual change. And so the most significant break with both of these traditions comes 
in the form of adult baptism. And the idea that God does not coerce anyone to be a follower of Christ, that's how they described infant baptism, that you are being coerced to be a Christian. And in their minds, no, uh, the, 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 the invitation uh, needs to be accepted. Uh, church authority, uh, very quickly Luther recognized that you, Luther had the, uh, the idea that <laughs> if you just put the word out there, just give people the Bible, everyone is going to read it like Luther. <laughs> I mean, that it was going to be obvious. The meaning, to his dismay, he recognized that people read scripture in a lot of different ways. And so he needed to reinstitute some authority for who can read scripture. And ultimately, he also was clear that the order in the church needed to eventually come back to secular rulers. And both of that, that, that understanding of church authority uh, is challenged by the Anabaptists to say, well, we think that voluntary groups can imagine every person as a priest of equal standing. I mean, there's, it comes to some discernment of gifts, but the priesthood of all believers is a very important theme that separates Anabaptists in some ways from both Catholics and Protestants. Christendom, the idea that the church is woven into the fabric of culture, uh, and even with the uh, political structures of the states, the Anabaptists push back on that, and they insist, no, the church is a voluntary community within a culture, and it's going to have visible boundaries that set it off from the culture around it. And finally, the principles of just war, which are carried forward both by Luther and deeply rooted in the Catholic tradition, the Anabaptists challenge uh, by, uh, with their uh, understanding of the gospel of peace, that Christ comes as the bringer of peace, and that just as God has loved each one of us without qualification, so too we are to love other people in the same way. All of that, now that's a, a, what I've said so far is pretty typical Anabaptist perspectives. There's a famous book, not so famous, I mean in a very small pond, it was famous. Uh, a book maybe 30 years ago called Neither Anabaptist, uh, uh, no, Anabaptism, Neither Catholic Nor Protestant. Just what I put up here. And that impulse to say, to define who we are by saying, well, we're not this and we're not that, is deeply embedded in our DNA. Um, we, we find it much easier to say what we're not than what we are. And frankly, it's part of the disease that has led us to continue to dividing up until the present. It's, it's easier to to find a negative identity than a positive. I'd like to conclude my brief uh, reflections uh, today by saying a few words about the way in which Anabaptism was deeply embedded in the spirituality and the culture and the faith of the Catholic tradition. Even though we spent 450 years trying to say, well, no, 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 that's not who we are. You know, um, it's often the, the best evidence of paternity is when the child says, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not related to those people. Um, and you, I think, diminish your own healthy understanding of who you are if you um, can't acknowledge uh, the debts that we have to our parents. So I'm going to I'm going to um, quickly identify five ways in which the Anabaptist movement in the 16th century, and I think Mennonites still today, were deeply indebted to Catholicism. The first, uh, late medieval mysticism. Now I just described earlier popular Catholicism as a faith that was visible in all of these tangible things. And it was that, but the beauty of the Catholic Catholicism is that it's a big house and there's a lot of things going on under that same roof. And part of what was happening in the 14th and 15th century was a reaction against some of that institutional rigidity and the emphasis on the visible in the emergence of a tradition, a spiritual tradition often called mysticism, that has as its core 
the conviction that every human being bears within him or herself part of the divine spark, the scintilla that you have a flame in you, the light in each one of us, granted by God when God shaped us out of the earth and then breathed the breath of life, made us in the image of God, and that that spark has a capacity to connect with God. Now, the capacity doesn't mean that we do it. In fact, we often live our lives sort of blind to our own divinity, but it's there. And with a kind of discipline and a kind of, uh, actually, anti-discipline, <laughs> with a kind of yielding, a letting go of the self, one can actually um, find communion directly with God. And this is a little bit unsettling in the Catholic tradition because it suggests that there are paths to God outside of the sacramental system or the institutional structure of the church. But it also is there, pulsating within the Catholic tradition. And the early Anabaptists, at least some of them, particularly people like Hans Denk, uh, um, uh, Pilgrim Marpeck, some other lesser known, you might not, uh, 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 and people on the edge, Caspar Schwenkfelder, picked up on these themes. They read Meister Eckhart. Um, they read people like John Towler. They read a very popular uh, text, anonymously written, called the German Theology. Luther also read that. And there they encountered this notion of yielding of the Christian life as a yielding to Christ. And that theme comes through so clearly, it comes through in the martyr's mirror, that the external things that are going on around us are incomprehensible, and yet we have the utter certainty that we can be in communion with God, and we can let go of these externals, and we can die with joy because our hearts are already connected with God. That comes out of, the, the language comes out of uh, late medieval uh, mysticism from the Catholic Church. At the same time, and sort of moving in a parallel but slightly different direction, there is a reform initiative within late medieval Catholicism that tries to get back to the simplicity and the clarity of Jesus himself and the teaching of the Gospels. Catholics know, yes, we need, a, we need the institutions, we need the sacraments, we, do, we need the structures of the church, but at its heart, the Christian life is about following Jesus. And one of the best-selling books in the late 15th century was a book by a Catholic writer, Thomas of Kempis, called The Imitation of Christ, a book that continues to, to be read around the world today. And it's really a very simple text. You would read it and you say, well, what's the big deal here? Because the text basically says to be a Christian is to be a little Christ. To be a Christian is to follow in the path of Jesus. And that means things like loving your neighbor, um, being gracious, the, the basic virtues of that seem self-evident, but that are an expression of the heart of Christianity. And we know that Anabaptists read The Imitation of Christ and found in it a path back to the Gospels and a kind of practical piety, of earnest, an earnest desire to live ordinary lives virtuously. Um, uh, I don't know if you can read that. Jesus always uh, has many who love his heavenly kingdom, but few who bear his cross. Does that sound familiar? Jesus has many people who love his heavenly kingdom, but few who bear his cross. Thomas Akempa's imitation of Christ was about following Jesus, ultimately on the path to the crucifixion and the resurrection. Other debts to the Catholic Church. Well, here I want to talk about Erasmus. Now, some Catholics, Catholics are kind of divided about Erasmus because um, uh, some of the things he said were disconcerting. Uh, but he himself understood, he, he, was, he never left the Catholic Church. He understood himself to be a good Catholic. And we, thanks to Erasmus, 
Um, I brought this along. In 1516, long before Luther, Erasmus was already hard at work gathering the best manuscripts he could find of the New Testament, the best Greek manuscripts he could find, because he knew that behind the Latin Vulgate, which was the Catholic text of the Middle Ages, behind that were actually Greek texts that were closer to Jesus, closer to the time of the Apostolic Church. He gathered those texts together, printed a Greek New Testament, and then alongside it, a fresh Latin translation so that educated Christians, Catholics, for the first time could have a text that was closer to the original, ad fontes, to the sources. He's a humanist, a Christian humanist. And then a fresh Latin translation. And he found some interesting things along the way, some corruptions that had crept into the Latin Vulgate that he thought readers should be aware of, at least. Um, I won't go into them, but some of them have theological significance. And he did this not to undermine the authority of the church, even though it had that effect, but to say, look, ordinary Christians should have access to Scripture, and they should have the best version possible, and he, we should be trusted to read this Scripture. And yes, we need the insight of tradition, He's not throwing out Aquinas and the church fathers, but we also need to each, the tradition is renewed only when we read the text ourselves and not just rely on the past. He also got into a rousing debate with Martin Luther on a crucial question. It's not something we probably stay awake at night worrying about, but in the 16th century, this was a big question, and that had to do with the freedom of the will. Luther thinking in sort of systematic, doctrinal, dogmatic terms, like the Calvinists who are going to come along later, said that if God is sovereign, if God is almighty, if God's all-powerful, if God is omniscient, then God if, must foreordain, God must predestine whatever happens. That's the character of God. And God can't have foreknowledge without foreordination. And because God knows what's going to happen, human beings have, we can only say thank you, right? We, for him, this is an important point, because if you think that you need to raise your hand at a revival meeting, if you think that God loves you because you said yes, you are already injecting your will into God's plan. And Luther is absolutely clear that you have nothing to do with your own salvation. And so this becomes an important point for Luther. Humans have no free will and, and questions of salvation. Erasmus comes along, he's a, he's a humanist. He says, no, no, that's the dignity of humanity is that we make choices. We can have meaningful choices about God's gift and the Anabaptists pick this up. This is at the heart of adult believers' baptism, is that you bear within yourself the dignity of that choice. And that that's an important part of the character of God to let you decide. Uh, oops. Five minutes. Okay. Um, the monastic ideals, the monastic principles. If you go back to, uh, I mean, deep within the Catholic tradition is a recognition that the hard sayings of Jesus, you know, we read the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says all these difficult things. And we know for ordinary people, it's really it's almost impossible. It feels impossible to do them. But in the Catholic tradition, there emerges the monastic orders and the monastics are people who are saying, you know, they are the spiritual athletes. They're saying, we're going to do what Jesus told us to do. And we can't do that by living in the midst of everyone, at least the early monastics. So we do it in retreat. So Benedict, St. Benedict's rule, describes an orderly Christian life in which the, the teachings of Christ can be, you can come close to living out what Jesus actually taught. Now that ideal, the monastic ideal, carried forward, and you could interpret the Anabaptist movement as saying all we are trying to do is be married monastics. 
our vision of the gathered community as a group of people, you know, we have everyone's Christian in the Middle Ages, right? Just by definition, everyone's Christian. They said, no, actually adult believer's baptism is a choice, like a monastic vow. No one forces you to be a monk. Well, in principle at least. And if you, but if you are, then you submit yourself to the discipline of the monastery. And we could go into more detail about specific characteristics, a distinctive garb, nonconformity to the world, pacifism, a sharing of, of possessions, um, an ordered life that looks in some ways very similar to the Amish um, and is carried forward in the Anabaptist tradition. Um, finally, I would say a long tradition of not just private acts of charity, like Thomas a Kempis, but a long tradition in the Catholic Church of recognizing that Christians are called into society to help transform, to help uh, address the needs of society's weakest. And so the emergence of hospitals in the Middle Ages, the emergence of schools, a concern for poor relief that's there in late medieval Catholicism, I think is carried forward, not just by Anabaptists, but it's carried forward in our tradition. Let's say we don't necessarily look to government to do these things. These are tasks of the church, and the church engages society to the extent, appropriately, to the extent that it addresses the needs of the poor. And I'll just end with uh, a kind of um, invitation. <laughs> we are a tiny group, Mennonites in the world. There's maybe two million Anabaptist Mennonites globally in the world. There's at least a billion Catholics. So we are 0.2 of 1% of the Catholic Church. We, we are the fleas on the backs of elephants, right? We, and yet... I would like to suggest that we are part of a universal church. We are part of a Catholic church. That's what the word means. And that we are participants, as are Catholics, in carrying forward a story, each in our own voice, in our own uh, distinctive uh, cultural expression, theological emphases, but that this is a shared tradition, and that it's a good thing when Christians ask, where does our tradition come together? Where can we recognize our distinctive gifts? And how can we celebrate being part of a universal church? And I'll end there.